Wires, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 134. On the New Hall grade, a dead body in a truck. In a trunk. And that's all. Rolls and questions. Every shriek of a siren is a living advertisement for Rio Grande crack gasoline. Thousands of times a day a siren screams and pedestrians and motorists get out of the way while a police car roars by, or a fire engine, or an ambulance, or a motorcycle. Every second counts when the siren's screaming, so the cities and counties that operate these emergency motors pick the fastest gasoline that they can find. The most convincing proof of the all-around superiority of Rio Grande crack gasoline is the indisputable fact that wherever it is sold, it is specified for more emergency cars than any other brand. How do you choose your gasoline? Do you just buy any gasoline at the most convenient station? Or have you discovered that by driving into the independent Rio Grande station near you, you can get Rio Grande crack gasoline? The same gasoline that is specified for the finest, fastest, most powerful emergency engines at no extra cost. Then, when a siren screams and when a police car roars past, you will thrill with the knowledge that whenever an emergency arises, you can get police car performance from your own car. And now it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The case you are about to hear dramatized differs from the average police case in that we had no inkling of a missing person or the fact that a crime had been committed until the murderer confessed. It may strike you that as a result, there was no work for the police to do. I hope that the story you are about to hear will convey to you how much work there always is for your police to do before they can call even a voluntarily confessed crime closed. Regardless of the emphasis with which a conscience-stricken murderer may confess, there is always a chance for something to go wrong before the case goes to court or while it is being tried. It is the duty of your police, beyond actually making the arrest of a criminal, so completely to investigate every angle of the case that the prosecution may be provided with an airtight case which no amount of legal acrobatics by the defense attorney can break down. Such was the work done by your police in this amazing affair of the woman with a heart of stone. It was a warm evening in April of 1924. High above the surf swept beach, an automobile comes to a stop on a lonely promontory on the Santa Monica Palisades. The occupants of the car are Mrs. Margaret Willis and her companion, Bert Webster. Webster flicks off the lights, the better to enjoy the lonely beauty of the ocean. He turns to Mrs. Wallace. Beautiful, isn't it, Margaret? Beautiful. It's terrible, Bert. I can't look at it. You can't look at it? No. See, what's the matter with you? Bert, don't stay here. Let's go on. I don't want to stay here. Well, I can't figure you out. You're always showing me a picture of an ocean or something and saying, isn't it beautiful? And now when I ask you the same thing about the real good, you tell me you can't stand to look at it. I can't figure it out. You don't have to figure anything out, Bert. Just please, let's go on. Okay, we're going. What's the matter, Margaret? Have I done something that's made you sore at me? No, you haven't done anything. And please, Bert, don't talk. I'm not in the mood for it. Well, but what... Oh, well, all right. Where are we going, Bert? Where do you suppose? Home, of course. You don't want to look at anything. You don't feel in the mood to talk. What else is there to do? I'd like to drive out to San Fernando. Out to San Fernando? Yes. Say, what's got into you? I'm not out for a tour of the country tonight. I'm tired. I know, Bert. So am I. But I want to drive out there just the same. Well, I don't know whether you're crazy or what, but I'm not going to do any such thing. I worked hard all day, and I need some rest. All right. Then I guess I'll have to tell you. Tell me what? It's about... It's... Well, go on. What the devil are you driving at? Bert, it's about Dr. Baldwin. 
Well, what about him? You remember I told you that his wife thought he was in Tijuana? Yes. Well, he isn't. Well, what of it? Where is he? He's in that trunk back there. Uh, is this your idea of a joke? No. It's a fact. He's in that trunk you helped me to tie on the back of this car. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go through with this, Peg? If what you've told me is true, you'd have a good chance of proving yourself innocent if you gave yourself up now before it's too late. Everything I've said is true, Bert. I'm afraid to face the police. It was self-defense. He tried to attack me, and I, well, I lost my head and shot him. I can't go back there. I can't do it. All right. I understand. And you will help me, Bert. You won't tell anyone? No, I won't, but I'm scared, Peg. I'm scared stiff. How much farther is it? Only a little ways. We can stop on the new hall grade, I think. Then hurry. Please hurry. There's a start of the grade right ahead of us. As soon as I see a good place, I'll stop. You've got to be awfully careful, Bert. Suppose someone should see us. That's the chance we take. We'll be arrested. I'd have to go back and answer questions. No one would believe me. There's a spot just ahead there. Do you see any car lights behind? No. No, I don't think so. Then this is it. Nobody in sight. Let's hurry. Can you untie the knots all right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, there they are. Now help me lift the trunk off the rack. There. Now can you lift up your end? Yes. I've got it. All right. Get it up on top of this guardrail. A little further. There. Hurry, Bert. Oh, hurry. Hurry. Look over the side and see if it's clear below. We don't want this to hang in some trees. And there's nothing to stop it. Then here it goes. Now, let's get out of here. Bert, what if it can be seen from the road in the daylight? I, I don't know. Only let's go. I'm going down there and look. I can't leave until I know it's completely hidden. But, Peg... You drive on up the grade and turn around. I'm going to hear as soon as I can get back up. Go on. Before someone comes. You're making a mistake, Peg, a bad mistake. Go on, All please. Right. I'll, I'll be right back. down there. I'm going to give myself up. I'm going to give myself up. And at 7 o'clock the following morning in the office of Detective Lieutenant Paul Stevens of the Los Angeles Homicide Squad. Morning, Luke, Sergeant. Anything exciting today? I'm afraid not, Lieutenant. Nothing more than a dame. A dame? You mean a woman, don't you, Sergeant? Well, woman or dame, whatever she is, she's been sitting in your office there since 6 o'clock this morning. So she's got to see you. All right, Sergeant. If that's the best you can offer, I'll go in to see what her trouble is. And don't forget, Sergeant, it isn't polite to call women dames. <laughs> Wait till you see her. You'll know what I mean. Good morning. Lieutenant Stevens. That's me. I've been waiting to see you, Lieutenant. I've killed a man. You what? I've killed a man. Well, that's quite a statement. Suppose you tell me who the man is. He was Dr. Benjamin Baldwin. He was drunk and tried to attack me. Would you mind telling me your name? Mrs. Margaret Willis. Thank you, Mrs. Willis. Now, where and when did you kill this man? Friday morning, in my apartment at 1008 West 11th Street. Mm, I see. And where is Dr. Baldwin's body now? I can lead you to it. But first, Lieutenant, I want you to see these... Bruises on your arms. Yes, bruises made when he grabbed me and tried to attack me. I wanted you to see them. For uh, future reference, eh? Organized 
organizing a party of seven men, including Inspector Dwight Longevin and Captain John Edwards, both of the detective division, Lieutenant Stevens leads the way to a police car and starts the long drive out to the Newhall grade. There's little conversation as the fast car roars along the highway, leaves the city limits, drops mile after mile behind it. And a little more than two hours after leaving Los Angeles, the confessed killer suddenly points to a spot at the side of the road. There, there's the place. All right, Blackwell, pull up here and stop. Yes, sir. Now, Mrs. Willis. It's down there. Come on, boys. Down the hill. You too, Mrs. Willis. There he is. Pretty, isn't it? Mm. He's dead all right. Got a bullet hole in his head. A buckler? Yes, sir. Take this conversation. Right. Mrs. Willis, do you positively identify this body? I do. It's Dr. Benjamin Baldwin. Whose trunk is this? Mine. How'd you get the body out here? I brought it out in a car. I have a friend who drives. He and I came out here last night. Do you own a car, Mrs. Willis? I do now, yes. I bought Dr. Baldwin's car. You bought... Hey, do you mean to tell me you drove Dr. Baldwin out here in his own car? In my car. It wasn't his any longer. I had the registration slip in my pocketbook. He turned it over to me. I see. Well, I'll, I'll take that if you don't mind. Now, just when did you buy the car, Mrs. Willis? Friday. Oh, no. No, it was Thursday, I believe. Yes, yes, Thursday. And when did you say you killed this man? Friday morning. He came to deliver the car on Friday and was very drunk. Had you paid him for the car in full? Yes, I paid him in full. I saw him put the money in his breast pocket. I'll swear to that. Is the money still in his pocket, Mrs. Willis? No. Oh, that is, I don't know whether it is or not. I gave it to him on Thursday. Mrs. Willis, who is this, uh, this friend that drove you out here? Well... Well, now you might as well tell us. It won't do him any good if you do if you lie about it. That's our dinner. Yes, sir. Good. Tell us about him, Mrs. Willis. Well, I, I've known him for five years. Mrs. Willis, are you Webster's common law wife? Uh, I'm not now. No. I see. And this Webster helped you put the Baldwin's body in this trunk. Certainly not. He knew nothing about it. I put it there myself. He was a pretty heavy man, Mrs. Willis. And I'm a very strong woman. I tell you, I put the body in this trunk all by myself. May I see your right hand a moment? Why, well, certainly. Thank you. You don't use that hand very much, do you? Why, no. Well, that is, not as much as my other one. I notice it's smaller than your left hand. Yes, I had an accident years ago. It crushed into a washing machine. And how did you get that trunk onto the back of your car? Uh, Bert helped me. Oh, then he knew about this all the time. He didn't. I told him it was filled with old books and files that I was going to move to a new office I had rented. He didn't know anything about it. Then how do you explain the, the fact that he helped you to throw this trunk over this cliff? I told him about it. After we got out here, I made him help me. When was this? Last night, I think. Yes, yes, it was last night. After we had driven out here. And he didn't know, know anything about, about the contents of the trunk until you reached this spot? No, he didn't. Well, I'm thinking we'd better get back to town and find this Bert Webster, Stevens. He ought to have a lot of interesting things to tell us. Turning to Los Angeles, Lieutenant Stevens and Inspector Langevin first assigned two detectives the unpleasant task of notifying Mrs. Baldwin of her husband's death. Then instruct another to bring in Webster for questioning. This done, they retired to Langevin's office. Well, Dwight, what do you make of it? Oh, there's something missing in the picture. That woman leaving a lot of things out of her answers. Do you suppose this Webster fellow is in on the deal? It looks like it. Somehow, the idea of his driving her out there, helping her get rid of the trunk and all that, and not having something to do with it, well, it just doesn't jive. I'm mighty anxious to ask him a lot of questions. Yeah, the thing I can't understand is why Mrs. Willis went to all the trouble of getting rid of the body, then walked in and told us about it. Doesn't make sense. I'm not so sure about that, that, Paul. It makes a lot of sense if you figure things out another way. Shoot. Well, well, just supposing she meant to pump this doctor off and get rid of him. Well, she goes through with it. Gets him in into the trunk, gets this Webster to drive her out in the valley and dumps the trunk. And the trunk inconveniently spills its occupant out on the ground for all the world to see. Then what? Well, being a woman, she hasn't the nerve to put it back in the trunk. So she figures out that a confession will help her self-defense story. Sure, but 
It still doesn't explain why, if it was self-defense, she went to all the trouble of making it look like a murder. Yeah. The answer is most likely because it was a murder. Now we agree. Come in. Captain Edwards is here with that Webster fellow, Lieutenant. Good. Send him in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. We'll probably know a lot more in a minute or so. I, I hope. I can hear Webster. Come in, Captain. This is Bert Webster, Inspector. Inspector Langevin and Lieutenant Stevens. Glad to know you. Sit down, down, Mr. Webster. We'll make this as short as possible. I presume you know why you're here, Mr. Webster. I guess I do, all right. I figured you'd be out for me before long. I want you to answer a few questions. And I want you to think very carefully before you answer us. Yes, sir. First of all... What do you know about this? Well, not a whole lot. I guess you already know more than I do. Oh, that's the name I call Mrs. Willis. Uh, Sort of a pet name, eh? I guess so. When did you first learn that Mrs. Willis had killed Baldwin? Last night. When last night? Well, I don't know exactly what time it was, but it was when we were driving in from the beach. Did she tell you about it before you drove out to the place where you helped her dispose of it? Yes, sir. She told me about it when I refused to drive her to San Fernando. She said that she'd done it to protect her honor and asked me to help her. Didn't you realize that you were aiding a criminal in the act of committing a crime? It had already been committed. Perhaps the murder had been committed, but it's a crime to help dispose of the body. Don't you know that? Well, yes, sir, I guess I do. You realize you're in a pretty tough spot, don't you, Webster? Yes, sir, only I didn't have anything to do with the actual killing. Well, that remains to be seen. However, I... I'm inclined to believe that you're telling the truth. I am, Lieutenant. Honest, I am. But until such a time as we can prove it one way or another... I'm afraid we'll have to book you as a material witness. You mean I've got to stay in jail? That's right. And while you're there, if you remember any additional things you think we might be interested in, just tell the guard. He'll let us know about it. They tell me that an honest confession is good for the soul. Locking up the bewildered Webster for further questioning, Langevin and Stevens drive to the home of Dr. Baldwin's widow. Now, Mrs. Baldwin, we realize that this is a terrible experience for you, but under the circumstances, we must ask you some questions. Of course. I understand. I will tell you all I can. Thank you. First of all, had Dr. Baldwin mentioned selling his car? Yes, He discussed it with me several times. He was going to sell it to Mrs. Willis? Yes. Can you remember anything about the last few days that might be of interest to us? Well, well, there were several things that seemed strange to me. But at the time, I didn't realize that there were anything that would lead to this. Easy now, Mrs. Baldwin. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm all right now. What were these things that you speak of, Mrs. Baldwin? Well, Thursday night... We had dinner with some friends, and the subject of the car came up. I suggested that the, the doctor call Mrs. Willis and see if she was ready to buy it. And did he? Yes, he did. I stood right beside him, and I heard him say, All right, that's fine. I'm glad you got it. I'll be over in the morning to deliver the car. By it, I suppose he meant the money. That's what I thought. Anyway, the next morning, Friday, he left the house early to deliver the car and get the money. You sure it was Friday, not Thursday? Positive. Go on, Mrs. Baldwin. Well, the doctor's office hours were from 2 to 5. And at 3 o'clock, his nurse telephoned me and asked if I knew when he was coming in because his patients were getting tired of waiting for him. He hadn't been to the office at all? No. So naturally, I called Mrs. Willis. Well, what did she tell you? She said that he had been there early that morning and delivered the car and then left. I remember that I asked her if she'd bought the car and she replied she had. I asked her how much she had paid for it and she said, I paid him $750 cash. Yesterday. That would be Thursday. Yes. But I knew that she couldn't have because I heard him talk to her on the phone Thursday night, as I told you. And she hadn't paid him anything for it then. What happened then, Mrs. Baldwin? I asked her why, if she'd bought it the day before, the doctor had driven it home Thursday night. What'd she say to that? Well, that he'd said he needed the car the next day. And she'd let him have it. And, well, then she said something very queer, Lieutenant. What was that, Mrs. Baldwin? Well, she asked me if my husband was a drinking man... And when I said no, she she said that it was funny. Because when he delivered the car that morning, he left his grips in it. And that he promised to come back later in the morning and give her another driving lesson. But that he hadn't. And this was in the afternoon? Yes. And, oh, and then she told me something that just didn't seem possible. She said that she didn't think he was coming back to me. 
that he mentioned going to Mexico and, and leaving me. Have you and Dr. Baldwin had any quarrel that might lead him to leave you? Certainly not. We were happy. <laughs> For the next seven days, the two detectives devote their entire time to questioning witnesses, breaking down Margaret Willis's self-defense story. And at the end of this time, they are in possession of these damaging facts. First, Mrs. Willis claims that Baldwin was drunk the day of the murder. A close acquaintance of his swears that he saw and talked to the doctor as late as 10 o'clock on Friday morning, that he had not been drinking. Second, an employee of the Percival Arms Apartments informs police that on the morning of the murder, he delivered the trunk empty to the Willis apartment, that when he was about to leave, he saw a man's shoe protruding from a hall closet, that although it looked like there might be a foot in it, he hadn't said anything until he read of the murder in the papers. From several neighbors of Margaret Willis, it is learned that she is a woman of great strength and possesses an insane temper when angry. Last, after several weeks of preparation, Margaret Willis is placed on trial for her life before Judge Charles Craig in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Several preliminary witnesses are heard, and then the court crowded to capacity with eager throngs craning for a look at the now famous woman. Deputy District Attorney Hammer calls Margaret Willis to the stand. Mrs. Willis, you realize that you're under oath, that you're sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Very well. Now, you say that on Friday morning, April 12th of this year, the deceased came to your house to deliver a car that you had purchased the day before for $750. That is right. And isn't it a fact that in reality you've not paid this man a dollar yet? I object, Your Honor. Incompetence, irrelevant, and immaterial. Objection sustained. Very well. Mrs. Willis, would you mind telling me exactly what took place in your apartment on the morning in question? Just tell me in your own words. Well, Dr. Baldwin brought the car over about 8 o'clock, and he was drunk. I object. All the rules. Proceed, please. He said, Lord, I love you this morning. And I asked him if he was drunk, and he said, maybe. Then what happened, Mrs. Willis? Well, he was going to give me a driving lesson, so I went to the closet to get a coat. And suddenly he came up behind me and tried to kiss me. I don't believe that. Continue, please. When he tried to kiss you, what did you do? I tried to get away from him, and he grabbed me. I told him not to be so silly to go out to the car, that I'd be right out. Did he go? Yes. At least I thought he'd gone. But when I came out of the closet, I found him standing there. He's looking drunker every minute. So what did you do then? I told him to please go, and he started toward me. So I backed into the closet and grabbed the gun that I always kept there. What kind of a gun, Mrs. Willis? A revolver. Is this gun marked People's Exhibit Number 2, the one, Mrs. Willis? Yes. That is the one. Thank you. You may continue. Well, I told him to leave or I'd shoot him. But he didn't. He grabbed me by the arm. With you holding the gun pointed at him? Yes. Why didn't you call for help? There were neighbors all around. Why, well, I didn't want any notoriety. Yet you'd rather shoot a man than have a little notoriety? I, I didn't think about that. You didn't think about his wife or his baby either, did you? I object, Your Honor. The question is leading and suggested. Objection overruled. Mrs. Willis, tell us in your own words just what happened from the point where he grabbed you by the arms to the actual shooting. We struggled a bit, and then I fell down with him still holding me. Suddenly, well, I guess I got scared because I saw his head right in front of the gun and I pulled the trigger. Did he die instantly? I... I guess so. Your Honor, my client doesn't know what she's saying. I can prove that she didn't even fire the shot that killed the deceased. It was her lover, Bert Webster, who killed him. <laughs> Court will be quiet or I will clear it. Mr. Laws, you've just made a serious accusation. Can you offer evidence to this court confirming it? I can, Your Honor, and I will. I can produce positive proof that Bert Webster was the killer of Dr. Baldwin. And before this trial is over, I will. But the defense attorney's statements proved to be no more than a last-minute desperate attempt to bring a retrial. And after reviewing the facts, Judge Crail submits the case to the jury. And in the press room... Yeah, I tell you, she'll get out of it. All it takes is a dame and a small attorney and it's a setup. You won't be right, Ed. I never saw it to fail. Doesn't matter whether she's young or old, the jury will fall for the old gag about you can't hang a woman. I wouldn't be surprised to see her get off with ten years, suspended. Yeah. Well, all I can say is if she does, there ain't no justice.
jury reached a verdict. Uh, we have, Your Honor. Will the clerk of the court read it, please? We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder is the first degree. Is there any reason why this court should not pass sentence at this time? No, Your Honor. Very well. Margaret Willis, stand and face the court. You have been found guilty of murder in the first degree. <laughs> Therefore, it is the verdict of this court that you shall be confined to the state penitentiary for the duration of your natural life. <laughs> <laughs> So Margaret Willis, murderess, was sent to the penitentiary for life, there to pay the penalty for her crime, a strange crime, this inasmuch as it was definitely proved that self-defense was not the reason for the murder. The only other reason was the desire to own Dr. Baldwin's automobile. It seems incredible that anyone, in possession of their full senses, could resort to murder for so small a gain, yet such was the fact in this fiction-like case. Thank you, Chief Davis. Photographs of Mrs. Willis Trunk murder case and the complete story of the amazing crime you have just heard are printed in the fascinating Calling All Cars News, a bigger and better publication this month than ever before, with several true detective mysteries, latest radio and, and movie news, and descriptions of 14 gifts that, radio, or that Rio Grande offers free to every boy and girl. Get your free copy of the news wherever Rio Grande crack gasoline is sold. This is the same gasoline used by many of the largest law enforcement agencies in the West. Rio Grande Crack gasoline speeds the police cars of many cities and counties to a speedier solution of the crime mysteries that you hear on this program. The same qualities that have caused this gasoline to be chosen to power more emergency cars than any other brand are needed by your car to develop its maximum speed and power. Give your car a chance with Rio Grande Cracked to show you some real police car performance. But when you're enjoying this greater speed and power, be sure that your engine is protected by motor oil that won't break down at high speeds. Rio Grande dealers recommend Sinclair motor oils because they are guaranteed to provide a thinner but tougher film of protection that never breaks down at any speed. You use less oil when you fill your crankcase with Sinclair motor oils because the wax, jelly, and carbon-forming impurities are already extracted. Sinclair motor oil makes the ideal running mate for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Sunday's police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 134 regarding a dead body found on Newhall grade. The body has been identified and suspect this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and Quest. Gary Breckner bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.